minutes to the bomb run. No fighters, no flak as yet. Primary is no go. Three passes and the aim point still obscured. Flax accurate for altitude and getting close. Navigator, plot course southwest to Nagasaki. In 1942, when Nazi Germany controlled much of Europe, the United States and its allies were working on the most secretive, ambitious project in history, the Manhattan Project, a race to beat the Nazis to the first atomic bomb. The weapon was developed at Los Alamos, high above Santa Fe, New Mexico, where scientists built a plutonium implosion device. After years of round-the-clock research and industrial effort, they proved it could work. Just before dawn on July 16, 1945, at a remote site called Trinity in the Jornada del Muerto desert, the device, nicknamed the Gadget, detonated with a yield of about 21 kilotons. Night turned to day, and a man-made sun rose over the desert. President Harry Truman was in Potsdam when news of Trinity reached him. A coded cable from New Mexico reported the test had been successful beyond expectations. It changed the tone of the conference. With Churchill and Stalin across the table, Truman now knew the bomb worked. On July 24th, he told Stalin, deliberately vague, that the United States had a weapon of unusual destructive power. Stalin, with a smirk, replied, I hope you'll make good use of it against the Japanese. Knowing full well about the secrets of the Manhattan Project through espionage. Two days later, on July 26th, came the Potsdam Declaration, issued by the United States, Britain and China. It called on Japan to surrender unconditionally, promised no enslavement of the nation, but demanded disarmament and war crimes trials and warned that if Japan failed to meet these demands, it would face prompt and utter destruction. In Tokyo, the divided leadership effectively did not accept, choosing to ignore the declaration with silence while pursuing a last-ditch hope for Soviet mediation. But even before that answer, the machinery was in motion. On July 25th, Truman approved General Karl Spatz's order authorizing the composite group to deliver atomic bombs as soon after August 3rd, as weather permitted, against a target list that included Hiroshima, Kokura, Niigata, and Nagasaki. Kyoto, once atop the list, had been removed after Secretary of War Henry Stimson argued it was the cultural and academic heart of Japan, and preserving it would matter for post-war reconciliation. Tokyo was not chosen because months of firebombing had already devastated the city, making damage assessment close to impossible. Instead, Hiroshima remained largely untouched, making it an ideal site to clearly gauge the atomic bomb's devastating effects. On August 6, 1945, the meticulously planned mission commenced at the Northfield Air Base on Tinian Island. At precisely 2.45 a.m., the silver Boeing B-29 Superfortress named Enola Gay, piloted by Colonel Paul Tibbetts, roared down the runway, carrying the world's first combat-ready atomic bomb, codenamed Little Boy. Weather's clear ahead. Ceiling unlimited. Maintain course and altitude. 
ETA to the IP, on time. Two accompanying aircraft, the Great Artiste, equipped with instrumentation to measure the bomb's explosive force and necessary evil, tasked with photography and documentation, followed closely behind. Little Boy was a gun-type uranium-235 fission bomb weighing approximately 9,700 pounds or about 4,400 kilograms designed to achieve critical mass through the rapid firing of a uranium projectile into a uranium target. This sudden union would initiate an uncontrolled chain reaction, releasing the equivalent explosive force of approximately 15,000 tons or 15 kilotons of TNT. After a six-hour flight covering roughly 1,500 miles or about 2,400 kilometers, the formation approached the Japanese mainland around 7 a.m. Weather reconnaissance aircraft, straight flush, had earlier confirmed clear skies over Hiroshima, sealing the city's fate. Approaching at an altitude of 31,000 feet, or about 9.5 kilometers, Tibbets began his bombing run, handing final control to Bombardier Major Thomas Farabee. Japanese radar detected the small group of aircraft around 7.09 a.m., prompting initial air raid sirens in Hiroshima. However, when observers realized it was only three planes, the military assumed it was merely a reconnaissance mission rather than a bombing raid. Tragically, they cancelled the alert, allowing daily life to resume in the city. At 8.09 a.m., the target, Ayoi Bridge, near the city centre, came clearly into view through Ferriby's Norden bombsite. Precisely at 8.15 a.m., as Enola Gay reached the optimal release point, Ferriby triggered the mechanism, opening the bomb bay doors and releasing Little Boy toward Hiroshima. Approximately 43 seconds after release, Little Boy reached its predetermined detonation altitude of 600 meters or just over 650 yards above the Shima Surgical Clinic, missing the intended target, Ayoi Bridge, by roughly 240 meters or about 260 yards. At this precise height, radar altimeters triggered internal mechanisms that fired the uranium projectile into the target initiating an instantaneous, unstoppable nuclear chain reaction. The explosion occurred in less than a microsecond, unleashing energy equivalent to approximately 15 kilotons of TNT. Instantly, a brilliant, blinding flash of white light engulfed the city, visible for miles around momentarily brighter than the sun. Observers on the ground described an intense burst followed by an enormous, deafening boom. A fiery nuclear fireball formed, rapidly expanding to about 200 meters or 216 yards in radius, vaporizing everything it touched. Radiating outward, the blast wave produced staggering devastation. Within roughly 340 meters or 370 yards, Nearly all reinforced concrete buildings were obliterated, with fatalities approaching 100%. Outward to about 1.7 kilometers, or just over a mile, residential buildings collapsed, widespread fires ignited, and massive loss of life occurred. At even greater distances, up to 4.5 kilometers, or 2.8 miles, the shockwave shattered windows, injuring thousands who had curiously approached windows after seeing the flash. The intense thermal radiation inflicted third-degree burns, penetrating skin layers deeply and rendering thousands of survivors severely disfigured or disabled. Within approximately 2 kilometers, or 1.2 miles, the heat was severe enough to cause instantaneous third-degree burns, and fires erupted throughout the city, creating a deadly firestorm that raged for hours. Of Hiroshima's roughly 350,000 inhabitants, Approximately 70,000 to 80,000 people died instantly from the blast, heat, and immediate radiation, many leaving only eerie human-shaped shadows behind, permanently etched into pavement and walls. 
Thousands more perished over the following months and years, succumbing to radiation sickness, burns, and associated cancers, pushing total casualties to well over 140,000 people by the end of 1945 alone. Later that same day, President Truman addressed the world, solemnly declaring that if Japan did not surrender, if they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. Despite the unprecedented destruction, Japan's leaders, paralyzed by internal division and disbelief, still did not offer surrender. So the decision followed to drop another atomic bomb. On August 9, 1945, three days after Hiroshima was destroyed, another meticulously planned atomic bombing mission took off from Northfield Air Base on Tinian Island, aiming to compel Japan's surrender. This time, six B-29 aircraft were assigned specific roles. The primary aircraft, a silver B-29 named Boxcar, piloted by Major Charles Sweeney, carried Fat Man, a plutonium-based implosion-type atomic bomb, far more sophisticated and powerful than the uranium-based device used on Hiroshima. The great artiste was tasked again with blast measurement instrumentation, while Big Stink was assigned photographic documentation. Two weather reconnaissance planes, Enola Gay, monitoring conditions over Kokura, and Lagin Dragon, checking Nagasaki, flew ahead and a spare aircraft full house returned early due to technical issues and did not proceed to the target. Shortly after takeoff, Boxcar faced a significant problem. A fuel transfer pump failed, leaving around 640 gallons of fuel unusable. Meanwhile, Big Stink failed to correctly make the planned rendezvous over Yakushima Island, south of the Japanese mainland, flying at the wrong altitude and executing long dogleg patterns rather than the briefed tight circles, causing confusion and delay. The formation proceeded toward Kokura, their primary target. Upon arrival, visibility was critically impaired, partially due to clouds, but mostly because workers at the nearby Yahata Steelworks deliberately burned coal tar to create thick black smoke, intentionally obscuring the city from bombing raids. Boxcar attempted three separate bombing runs over Kokura, each unsuccessful as bombardier Captain Kermit Behan struggled to visually confirm the aiming point. Adding to their urgency, increasingly accurate Japanese anti-aircraft fire bracketed the aircraft. Eventually, after the third failed pass, the crew abandoned Kokura for their secondary target, Nagasaki. The failed attempt on Kokura later gave rise to the phrase, Kokura's luck referring to narrowly escaping disaster without even realizing it. As Boxcar turned southwest toward Nagasaki, fuel became critically low. Although the crew had agreed beforehand that landing with a fully armed atomic bomb was too risky, making ditching the fat man at sea preferable, it was decided that radar bombing over Nagasaki could be performed if visual targeting failed, with jettisoning as a last resort only. Shortly before 11 a.m., the formation arrived over Nagasaki. Visibility here too was poor, but a sudden break in cloud cover allowed Beihan a momentary visual confirmation of the target. At precisely 11 a.m., the great artiste dropped instrument packages designed to measure the blast. Instrument canister away. Shoots good. Signals live. Roger, great artiste. Hold your track. We're awaiting visual on target. One minute later, at 11.01 a.m., Behan shouted, I've got it! I've got it! and released the Fat Man bomb. At exactly 11.02 a.m., Fat Man detonated above Nagasaki, unleashing another devastating atomic blast upon Japan. Fat Man detonated approximately 503 meters, or 550 yards, above Nagasaki, exploding with a yield of roughly 21 kilotons. 
Immediately, an immense nuclear fireball measuring around 222 meters or 243 yards in radius engulfed the city center, momentarily generating temperatures hotter than the surface of the sun. Anything within this volume was simply obliterated. Buildings, vehicles, and human beings erased from existence in a blinding flash. The initial blast wave extended outwards, delivering catastrophic destruction within a radius of roughly 760 meters or 830 yards, where reinforced concrete buildings were demolished. Within a wider radius of about 1.7 kilometers or just above a mile, residential and commercial buildings collapsed. Fires ignited uncontrollably and casualties became widespread. Tens of thousands of Nagasaki's residents experienced severe injuries or were trapped beneath debris. By the end of 1945, approximately 60,000 to 80,000 people in Nagasaki had perished from the explosion, fires, and immediate radiation effects. Adding to Japan's problems, shortly before midnight on August 8th, the Soviet Union launched a massive invasion of Japanese-held Manchuria, shattering Japan's last desperate hope for Soviet mediation. Facing the overwhelming reality of dual catastrophes, the unprecedented devastation from atomic bombings and the massive Soviet offensive, Emperor Hirohito acknowledged the futility of continued resistance, declaring to his people that the enemy possessed a new and most cruel bomb. Finally, on August 15, 1945, Japan announced its unconditional surrender. The formal surrender document was signed aboard the battleship USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay on September 2, 1945, officially ending World War II. Today, 80 years have passed since humanity first unleashed atomic destruction upon itself. Eight decades since that fateful event, often called man's last bomb, the world still lives under the shadow of nuclear annihilation. The hope remains that Hiroshima and Nagasaki will forever mark the first, the last, and only time these weapons were ever used in war.